There is a subject discussed frequently by Mel Nibonet's philosophers concerning the number of worlds in the universe and how many universes make up the multiverse. Planes is a more common word they employ since they do not have the notion of worlds as globes. Some believe these can be visited in dreams and reached by the moonbeam roads which run between the worlds. Thus they have developed their sophisticated method of the dream couches, where certain privileged aristocrats lie to dream the dreams of years, centuries, even millennia in a few hours. Elric, who had in his youth learned his sorcerer's skills on the dream couches of Imria, no longer remembered his experience of the moonbeam roads, so the nature of the universe was again a mystery to him. Though sometimes a memory would return as a nightmare which would bring him screaming back to wakefulness. After the events recorded in the first volume of this history, Elric determined to explore the lands which surrounded his own, deeming it a matter of common sense to understand the nature of those who, realistically, were planning the destruction of his world and his family with it. In fact, it is likely the young albino was moved as much by curiosity as moral purpose. Yet, who of us at his age is entirely sure of the reason for their actions? Let us accept the reasons he gave and concern ourselves instead with other matters. Elric had one recurring dream which disturbed his nights. He dreamed he returned to a Melnebene made even stranger and more bizarre under his cousin Yerkun's rule. Almost nothing was entirely familiar to him. The great towers of Imria were warped and twisted into a troubling architecture which seemed to reflect the mental states of those gone entirely mad. Unnatural beasts prowled the serpentine streets, and gigantic demonic creatures lolled in the city squares. The palaces had grown huge to accommodate those newcomers, and Melnibonians were dwarfed to the size of ants in comparison. Where Elric's kinfolk had once lived now dwelled creatures of cryptic biology, with carapaces encrusted in carbuncular jewels and organs which throbbed upon the surface of their bodies, with vast multifaceted eyes which seemed blind and yet looked into worlds no other could see, with a multitude of arms and legs and other limbs whose function was impossible to guess. Bizarre creatures of chaos ran through corridors which had become labyrinths, and in the re-wrought chambers of the towers, Melnibonians, driven mad by their exposure to these new demons, feasted on unnatural food and pleasured themselves in even stranger ways. Cries of horror and pain were the perpetual music filling this Melnibonian. In this dream, Elric made his way to the great throne chamber, where Urkun, gaunt and crazed, enjoyed intercourse with his demonic allies and lived in a state of perpetual celebration. Clearly, he took no delight in Elric's arrival. "'Where is your sister?' demanded the albino. "'Where is my betrothed?' And Urkun at last reluctantly sent for her. The woman who came to the throne chamber was only barely recognizable to Elric. She was dressed in heavy clothing encrusted with gold, silver, and platinum. She could barely move, and her eyes were drugged. Little dwarfish creatures carried her train and crept in and out of her clothing, adjusting this, altering that. When she saw Elric, she smiled, and it was a hideous travesty clear to Elric that she was under an enchantment. In the dream, Elric led his beloved away from the throne chamber, past ornamental pools where his beloved dragon brothers, the Fawn, seemed imprisoned. Once, Flamefang, his closest dragon kin, rose from the coruscating liquid and addressed him. We are all slaves of chaos now, dear lord all slaves of this nightmare. But he promised that when Elric and Simoral wished to leave, he would try to carry them on his back to safety. 
though this stuff which is not water it corrodes us in such strange ways then Elric found himself in a great chamber filled by an enormous bed carved with obscene figures Simoril spoke to him in an unfamiliar language her love making was that of a stranger when he did understand her words he scarcely understood their meaning her tongue was thick as if she had forgotten the high speech of Melnimone. He told me that Ariok had killed you and eaten your sword. And when Elric looked up through the canopy of that strange bed, he saw eyes he recognized. They were the mocking, triumphant, sardonic eyes of Ariok himself. They lay together in that bridal chamber. Some might have considered it ostentatious. Some might have found it terrifying. Elric hardly saw the carvings and the decorations, for he was filled with complex premonitions. We shall be married now you are returned to Melnibone, said Simon. And on those words, always, Elric would awake wondering in panic if he should not return at once to Melnibone, break his word and reclaim his throne. He feared that his actions had already produced cosmic reverberations of unprecedented significance. But circumstances led him in other directions. Try as he might, he could not find the way home. And eventually he reconciled himself to the fact that his destiny lay elsewhere, that there were things he must do, things he must learn, before he could ever return. In his wakeful moments, when his sense of reality was restored, he told himself that only by mingling with the people of the young kingdoms would he learn what he needed. But as is often the case when the powerful design to learn the secrets of the powerless, his condescension was resented, his company rejected. Like so many before and after him, he discovered what a distance his power put between himself and those he envied. Envy comprised much of what he felt for people he regarded as less complicated souls, leading simpler lives than his own and carrying less complex burdens. Elric was too young, too self-involved to realize that only to him were those problems less complex and that those he envied actually envied him his power which from their particular perspective would if possessed by them entirely simplify and improve their lives beyond the walls of Elric's particular plane the lords of the higher worlds continued to plot and plan not only Elric's fate but that of his people their friends and enemies. The machinations of those called gods would lead Elric to explore some of the other worlds of the multiverse, falling into the power of legendary Agak and Gagak, encountering the dead Melnibonean Earl Saxif Da'an, and learning still more of his people's past, of the mysterious blind captain who steered the ship of fate, and, most importantly, of the eternal champion of whom he was an avatar. Other avatars he would meet were called Coram, Ericose, Hawkmoon, champions whom some knew as the three who are one before his joining them, whereupon, naturally enough, they became the four who are one. All these men were bound upon quests of their own, all sought fabled Tamalorn, where, it is said, the champion eternal shall find eternal peace. They dreamed of Tanalorn. They desired Tanalorn as some men desired women and others desired wealth. They longed for Tanalorn as a place they had lost, perhaps before they were born, as a place which, like paradise, might not, by definition, exist at all. Tanalorn, some called it the city of eternal rest, beloved of those who welcome death. Some of a simpler and perhaps more cynical disposition say it is indeed no more than another name for the grave. 
But I can tell you that Tanalorn is a powerful dream. It is what causes great heroes and heroines to perform great deeds. It is what raises us above the lords of the higher worlds and makes us, poor mortals that we are, something nobler and more powerful than any who seek to control our destinies. Dream Tanalorn might be to some of us, but to others it is a reality, a reality we have molded from the stuff of imagination and which stands for all our idealism all our fine ambitions, all our yearnings, and all our nobler selves. Though we spend many lifetimes seeking Tanalorn, find her at last we shall, and there, as we are promised, we shall know not only peace, but wisdom and security. But the building of that city shall take many great dreams and much courage, and you can be sure that not a single drop of savagely spilled blood will taint a single brick or stone of her. So now begins the second tale of the albino. Forgetting as best he could his cousin Urkun sitting as regent upon the ruby throne of Malnivone, Suppressing all thoughts of his beautiful cousin Simoral, weeping for him and despairing of his ever returning, Elric went to seek an unknown goal in the worlds of the young kingdoms, where Melnibonaeans were at best disliked. And it would not be long before he found himself sailing upon the mysterious seas of fate. What he found upon those seas is the substance of this story. The Sailor on the Seas of Fate Book One, Sailing to the Future In which the Prince of Ruins embarks upon a mysterious ship It was as if the man stood in a vast cavern whose walls and roof were composed of gloomy, unstable colors, which would occasionally break and admit rays of light from the moon. That these walls were mere clouds massed above the mountains and oceans was hard to believe, for all that the moonlight pierced them, stained them, and revealed the black and turbulent sea washing the shore on which the man now stood. Distant thunder rolled, Distant lightning flickered, a thin rain fell, and the clouds were never still. From dusky jet to deadly white they swirled slowly, like the cloaks of men and women engaged in a trance-like and formalistic minuet. The man standing on the shingle of the grim beach was reminded of giants dancing to the music of the faraway storm, and felt as one must feel who walks unwittingly into a hall where the gods are at play. He turned his gaze from the clouds to the ocean. The sea seemed weary. Great waves heaved themselves together with difficulty and collapsed as if in relief, gasping as they struck sharp rocks. The man pulled his hood closer about his face and looked over his leathern shoulder more than once as he trudged closer to the sea and let the surf spill upon the toes of his knee-length black boots. He tried to peer into the cavern formed by the clouds, but could only see a short distance. There was no way of telling what lay on the other side of the ocean, or, indeed, how far the water extended. He put his head on one side, listening carefully, but could hear nothing but the sounds of the sky and the sea. He sighed. For a moment a moonbeam touched him, and from the white flesh of his face there glowed two crimson-tormented eyes. Then darkness came back. Again the man turned, plainly fearing that the light had revealed him to some enemy. Making as little sound as possible, he headed towards the shelter of the rocks on his left. Elric was tired. In the city of Rifel, in the land of Picarade, he had naively sought acceptance by offering his services as a mercenary in the army of the governor of that place. For his foolishness, he had been imprisoned as a Melnibonean spy. It was obvious to the governor that Elric could be nothing else, and had but recently escaped with the aid of bribes and some minor sorcery. 
The pursuit, however, had been almost immediate. Dogs of great cunning had been employed, and the governor himself had led the hunt beyond the borders of Picarade into the lonely, uninhabited shale valleys of a world locally called the Dead Hills, in which little grew or tried to live. Up the steep sides of small mountains whose slopes consisted of gray, crumbling slate, which made a clatter to be heard a mile or more away, the white-faced one had ridden. Along dales all but grassless, and whose river bottoms had seen no water for scores of years, through cave tunnels bare of even a stalactite, over plateaus from which rose cairns of stones erected by a forgotten folk, he had sought to escape his pursuers. And soon it seemed to him that he had left the world he knew forever, that he had crossed a supernatural frontier and arrived in one of those bleak places of which he had read in the legends of his people, where once law and chaos had fought each other to a stalemate, leaving their battleground empty of life and the possibility of life. And at last he had ridden his horse so hard that its heart had burst, and he had abandoned its corpse and continued on foot, panting to the sea, to this narrow beach, unable to go farther forward, and fearing to return lest his enemies should be lying in wait for him. He would give much for a boat now. It would not be long before the dogs discovered his scent and led their masters to the beach. He shrugged. Best to die here alone, perhaps, slaughtered by those who did not even know his name. His only regret would be that Simril would wonder why he had not returned at the end of the year. He had little food, and few of the drugs which had of late sustained his energy. Without renewed energy he could not contemplate working a sorcery, which might conjure for him some means of crossing the sea, and making, perhaps, for the Isle of the Purple Towns, where the people were least unfriendly to Melnibonaeans. It had been months since he had left behind his court and his queen-to-be, letting Irkun sit on the throne of Melnibone until his return. He had thought he might learn more of the human folk of the young kingdoms by mixing with them, but they had rejected him, either with outright hatred or wary and insincere humility. Nowhere had he found one willing to believe that a Melnibonean, and they did not know he was the emperor, would willingly throw in his lot with the human beings who had once been enthralled to that cruel and ancient race. And now, as he stood beside a bleak sea feeling trapped and already defeated, he knew himself to be alone in a malevolent universe, bereft of friends and purpose, a useless sickly anachronism, a fool brought low by his own insufficiencies of character, by his profound inability to believe wholly in the rightness or the wrongness of anything at all. He lacked faith in his race, in his birthright, in gods or men, and above all, he lacked faith in himself. His pace slackened. His hand fell upon the pommel of his black rune sword. Stormbringer, seemingly half-sentient, was now his only companion, his only confidant, and it had become his neurotic habit to talk to the sword as another might talk to his horse, or as a prisoner might share his thoughts with a cockroach in his cell. Well, Stormbringer, shall we walk into the sea and end it now? At least we shall have the pleasure of thwarting those who follow us. He made a half-hearted movement toward the sea, but to his fatigued brain it seemed that the sword murmured, stirred against his hip, pulled back. The albino chuckled. You exist to live and to take lives. Do I exist then to die and bring both those I love and hate the mercy of death? Sometimes I think so. A sad pattern, if that should be the pattern. Yet there must be more to all this. He turned his back upon the sea, peering upward at the monstrous clouds forming and reforming above his head letting the light rain fall upon his face, listening to the complex melancholy music which the sea made as it washed over rocks and shingle and was carried this way and that by conflicting currents. The rain did little to refresh him. He had not slept at all for two nights and had slept hardly at all for several more. He must have ridden almost for a week before his horse collapsed. 
At the base of a damp granite crag, which rose nearly thirty feet above his head, he found a depression in the ground, in which he could squat and be protected from the worst of the wind and the rain. Wrapping his heavy leather cloak tightly about him, he eased himself into the hole and was immediately asleep. Let them find him while he slept. He wanted no warning of his death. Harsh gray light struck his eyes as he stirred. He raised his neck, holding back a groan at the stiffness of his muscles, and he opened his eyes. He blinked. It was morning, perhaps even later, for the sun was invisible, and a cold mist covered the beach. Through the mist, the darker clouds could still be seen above, increasing the effect of his being inside a huge cavern. Muffled a little, the sea continued to splash and hiss, though it seemed calmer than it had on the previous night, and there were now no sounds of a storm. The air was very cold. Elric began to stand up, leaning on his sword for support, listening carefully, but there was no sign that his enemies were close by. Doubtless they had given up the chase, perhaps after finding his dead horse. He reached into his belt pouch and took from it a sliver of smoked bacon and a vial of yellowish liquid. He sipped from the vial, replaced the stopper, and returned the vial to his pouch as he chewed on the meat. He was thirsty. He trudged further up the beach and found a pool of rainwater not too tainted with salt. He drank his fill, staring around him. The mist was fairly thick, and if he moved too far from the beach, he knew he would become immediately lost. It did that matter? He had nowhere to go. Those who had pursued him must have realized that. Without a horse, he could not cross back to Picarade, the most easterly of the young kingdoms. Without a boat, he could not venture onto that sea and try to steer a course back to the Isle of the Purple Towns. He recalled no map which showed an eastern sea, and he had little idea of how far he had traveled from Picarade. He decided that his only hope of surviving was to go north, following the coast in the trust that sooner or later he would come upon a port or a fishing village where he might trade his few remaining belongings for a passage on a boat. Yet that hope was a small one, for his food and his drugs could hardly last more than a day or so. He took a deep breath to steel himself for the march and then regretted it. The mist cut at his throat and his lungs like a thousand tiny knives. He coughed. He spat upon the shingle. And he heard something. Something other than the moody whisperings of the sea. A regular creaking sound, as of a man walking in stiff leather. His right hand went to his left hip and the sword which rested there. He turned about, peering in every direction for the source of the noise, but the mist distorted it. It could have come from anywhere. Elric crept back to the rock where he had sheltered. He leaned against it so that no swordsman could take him unawares from behind. He waited. The creaking came again, but other sounds were added. He heard a clanking, a splash, perhaps a voice, perhaps a footfall on timber. And he guessed that either he was experiencing a hallucination as a side effect of the drug he had just swallowed, or he had heard a ship coming towards the beach and dropping its anchor. He felt relieved and he was tempted to laugh at himself for assuming so readily that this coast must be uninhabited. He had thought that the bleak cliffs stretched for miles, perhaps hundreds of miles, in all directions. The assumption could easily have been the subjective result of his depression, his weariness. It occurred to him that he might as easily have discovered a land not shown on maps, yet with a sophisticated culture of its own, with sailing ships, for instance, and harbors for them, Yet still, he did not reveal himself. Instead, he withdrew behind the rock, peering into the mist towards the sea. And at last, he discerned a shadow which had not been there the previous night, a black, angular shadow which could only be a ship. He made out the suggestion of ropes. He heard men grunting. He heard the creak and rasp of a yard as it traveled up a mast. The sail was being furled. Elric waited at least an hour expecting the crew of the ship to disembark. They could have no other reason for entering this treacherous bay. But a silence had descended, as if the whole ship slept. Cautiously, 
Elric emerged from behind the rock and walked down to the edge of the sea. Now he could see the ship a little more clearly. Red sunlight was behind it, thin and watery, diffused by the mist. It was a good-sized ship, and fashioned throughout of the same dark wood. Its design was baroque and unfamiliar, with high decks fore and aft, and no evidence of rowing ports. This was unusual in a ship either of Melnibonean or Young Kingdom's design, and it tended to prove his theory that he had stumbled upon a civilization for some reason cut off from the rest of the world, just as Elwer and the unmapped east were cut off by the vast stretches of the sighing desert and the weeping waste. He saw no movement aboard, heard none of the sounds one might usually expect to hear on a seagoing ship, even if the larger part of the crew was resting. The mist eddied, and more of the red light poured through to illuminate the vessel, revealing the large wheels on both the foredeck and the rear deck, the slender mast with its furled sail, the complicated geometrical carving of its rails and its figurehead the great curving prow which gave the ship its main impression of power and strength, and made Elric think it must be a warship rather than a trading vessel. But who is there to fight in such waters as these? He cast aside his weariness and cupped his hands about his mouth, calling out, Hail the ship! The answering silence seemed to him to take on a peculiar hesitancy, as if those on board heard him, and wondered if they should answer. Hail the ship! Then a figure appeared on the port rail, and, leaning over, looked casually toward him. The figure had on armor as dark and as strange as the design of his ship. He had a helmet obscuring most of his face, and the main feature that Elric could distinguish was a thick, golden beard and sharp blue eyes. Hail the shore! said the armored man. His accent was unknown to Elric. His tone was as casual as his manner. Elric thought he smiled. What do you seek with us? Aid. I am stranded here. My horse is dead. I am lost. Lost? Huh. Lost, and you wish to come aboard? I can pay a little. I can give my services in return for a passage either to your next port of call or to some land close to the young kingdoms, where maps are available, so I could make my own way thereafter. Well, there's work for a swordsman. I have a sword. I see it. A good big battle blade. Then I can come aboard. We must confer first, if you would be good enough to wait a while. Of course. Elric was nonplussed by the man's manner, but the prospect of warmth and food on board the ship was cheering. He waited patiently until the blond-bearded warrior came back to the rail. Your name, sir? I am Elric of Melnibene. The warrior seemed to be consulting a parchment, running his finger down a list until he nodded, satisfied, and put the list into his large buckled belt. Well... There was some point in waiting here, after all. I found it difficult to believe. What was the dispute, and why did you wait? For you, said the warrior, heaving a rope ladder over the side so that its end fell into the sea. Will you board now, Elric of Melnibene? Chapter 2 The Blind Captain Elric was surprised by how shallow the water was, and he wondered by what means such a large vessel could come so close to the shore. Shoulder deep in the sea, he reached up to grasp the ebony rungs of the ladder. He had great difficulty heaving himself from the water, and was further hampered by the swaying of the ship and the weight of his room sword. But eventually, he had clambered awkwardly over the side and stood on the deck, with the water running from his clothes to the timbers and his body shivering with cold. He looked about him. Shining, red-tinted mist clung to the ship's dark yards and rigging. White mist spread itself over the roofs and sides of the two large cabins set fore and aft of the mast. And this mist was not of the same character as the mist beyond the ship. Elric for a moment had the fanciful notion that the mist traveled permanently wherever the ship traveled. 
He smiled to himself, putting the dreamlike quality of his experience down to the lack of food and sleep. When the ship sailed into sunnier waters, he would see it for the relatively ordinary vessel it was. The blonde warrior took Elric's arm. The man was as tall as Elric and massively built. Within his helm, he smiled, saying, Let us go below. They went to the cabin forward of the mast, and the warrior drew back a sliding door, standing aside to let Elric enter first. Elric ducked his head and went into the warmth of the cabin. A lamp of red-gray glass gleamed, hanging from four silver chains attached to the roof, revealing several more bulky figures fully dressed in a variety of armors, seated about a square and sturdy sea table. All faces turned to regard Elric as he came in, followed by the blonde warrior who said, This is he. One of the occupants of the cabin who sat in the farthest corner and whose features were completely hidden by the shadow nodded. Aye, that is he. You know me, sir, said Elric, seating himself at the end of the bench and removing his sodden leather cloak. The warrior nearest him passed him a metal cup of hot wine, and Elric accepted it gratefully, sipping at the spiced liquid and marveling at how quickly it dispersed the chill within him. In a sense, said the man in the shadows. His voice was sardonic and at the same time had a melancholy ring, and Elric was not offended, for the bitterness in the voice seemed directed more at the owner than at any he addressed. The blonde warrior seated himself opposite Elric. I am Brute, once of Lashmar, where my family still holds land, but it is many a year since I have been there. From the young kingdoms, then? I, once... This ship journeys nowhere near those nations? I believe it does not. It is not so long, I think, since I myself came aboard. I was seeking Tanalorn, but found this craft instead. Tanalorn? How many must seek that mythical place? Do you know of one called Rakir, once a warrior priest of Fum? We adventured together once. He left to look for Tanalorn. I do not know him, said Brute of Lashmar. And these waters, do they lie far from the young kingdoms? Very far, said the man in the shadows. Are you from Elware, perhaps, asked Elric, or, or from any other of what we in the West call the unmapped East? Most of our lands are not on your maps, said the man in the shadows, and he laughed. Again, Elric found that he was not offended, and he was not particularly troubled by the mysteries hinted at by the man in the shadows. Soldiers of fortune, as he deemed these men to be, were fond of their private jokes and references. It was usually all that united them, save a common willingness to hire their swords to whomever could pay. Outside, the anchor was rattling and the ship rolled. Elric heard the yard being lowered, and he heard the smack of the sail as it was unfurled. He wondered how they hoped to leave the bay with so little wind available. He noticed that the faces of the other warriors, where their faces were visible, had taken on a rather set look as the ship began to move. He looked from one grim, haunted face to another, and he wondered if his own features bore the same cast. For where do we sail? he asked. Brute shrugged. I only know we had to stop to wait for you, Elric of Melnibane. You knew I would be there? The man in the shadows stirred and helped himself to more hot wine from the jug set into a hole in the center of the table. You are the last one we need. I was the first taken aboard. So far, I have not regretted my decision to make the voyage. Your name, sir. Elric decided he would no longer be at that particular disadvantage. Oh, names. <laughs> Names, I have so many. The one I favor is Eric Jose. But I have been called Ulrich Skarzol and John Dacre, and Ilion of Garathorn to my certain knowledge. Some would have me believe that I have been Elric Womanslayer. Womanslayer? An unpleasant nickname? Who is this other Elric? That I cannot completely answer, but I share a name, it seems, with more than one aboard this ship. I, like Brute, sought Tanalorn, and found myself here instead. We have that in common, 
said another. He was a black-skinned warrior, the tallest of the company, his features oddly enhanced by a scar running like an inverted V from his forehead and over both eyes, down his cheeks to his jawbones. I was in a land called Gajaki, a most unpleasant swampy place filled with perverse and diseased life. I had heard of a city said to exist there, and I thought it might be Tanalon. It was not and it was inhabited by a blue-skinned hermaphroditic race who determined to cure me of what they considered my malformations of hue and sexuality. This scar, you see, was their work. The pain of their operation gave me strength to escape them, and I ran naked into the swamps, floundering for many a mile until the swamp became a lake feeding a broad river over which hung black clouds of insects which set upon me hungrily. The ship appeared and I was more than glad to seek its sanctuary. I am Otto Blendker, once a scholar of Brunes, now a hireling sword for my sins. This Brunes, does it lie near Elware? said Elric. He had never heard of such a place, nor of such an outlandish name in the young kingdoms. The black man shook his head. I know not of Elware. Then the world is a considerably larger place than I imagined. Indeed it is, said Eric Jose. What would you say if I offered you the theory that the sea on which we sail spans more than one world? I would be inclined to believe you, Elric smiled. I have studied such theories. More, I have experienced adventures in worlds other than my own. It is a relief to hear it. Not all on board this ship are willing to accept my theory. I come closer to accepting it, said Otto Blenker, though I find it terrifying. It is that, agreed Eric Jose. More terrifying than you can imagine, friend Otto. Elric leaned across the table and helped himself to a further mug of wine. His clothes were already drying, and physically he had a sense of well-being. I'll be glad to leave this misty shore behind. The shore's been left already, said Brute. But for the mist, it is ever with us. Mist appears to follow the ship, or else the ship creates the mist wherever it travels. It is rare that we see land at all, and when we do see it, as we saw it today, it is usually obscured like a reflection in a dull and buckled shield. We sail on a supernatural sea, said another holding out a gloved hand for the jug. Elric passed it to him. In Hasgan, where I come from, we have a legend of a bewitched sea. If a mariner finds himself sailing in those waters, he may never return and will be lost for eternity. Your legend contains at least some truth, I fear, Turdrick of Hasgan, Bert said. How many warriors are on board? Elric asked. Sixteen. Other than the four, said Eric Jose. Twenty in all. The crew numbers about ten, and then there is the captain. You will see him soon, doubtless. The four? Who are they? Eric Jose laughed. <laughs> you and I are two of them. The other two occupy the aft cabin. And if you wish to know why we are called the four, you must ask the captain. Although I warn you, his answers are rarely satisfying. Elric realized he was being pressed slightly to one side. The ship makes good speed, considering how poor the wind was. Excellent speed, agreed Eric Jose. He rose from his corner, a broad-shouldered man with an ageless face bearing the evidence of considerable experience. He was handsome, and he had plainly seen much conflict, for both his hands and his face were heavily scarred, though not disfigured. His eyes, though deep-set and dark, seemed of no particular color, and yet were familiar to Elric. He felt that he might have seen those eyes in a dream once. Have we met before? Oh, possibly. Or shall meet. What does it matter? Our fates are the same. We share an identical doom. And possibly we share more than that. More? I hardly comprehend the first part of your statement. Then it is for the best, said Eric Jose, inching past his comrades and emerging on the other side of the table. He laid a surprisingly gentle hand on Elric's shoulder. Come, 
We must seek an audience with the captain. He expressed a wish to see you shortly after you came aboard. Elric nodded and rose. This captain? What is his name? He has none he will reveal to us, said Eric Jose. Together they emerged onto the deck. The mist was, if anything, thicker and of the same deathly whiteness, no longer tinted by the sun's rays. It was hard to see to the far ends of the ship, and for all that they were evidently moving rapidly, there was no hint of a wind. Yet it was warmer than Elric might have expected. He followed Ericose forward to the cabin set under the deck on which one of the ship's twin wheels stood, tended by a tall man in seacoat and leggings of quilted deerskin who was so still as to resemble a statue. The red-haired steersman did not look around or down as they advanced toward the cabin, but Elric caught a glimpse of his face. The door seemed built of some kind of smooth metal possessing a sheen almost like the healthy coat of an animal. It was reddish-brown, and the most colorful thing Elric had seen so far on the ship. Eric Jose knocked softly upon the door. Captain, Elric is here. Enter. The door opened. Rosy light flooded out, half-blinding Elric as he walked in. As his eyes adapted, he could see a very tall, pale-clad man standing upon a richly-hued carpet in the middle of the cabin. Elric heard the door close and realized that Eric Jose had not accompanied him inside. "'Are you refreshed, Elric?' said the captain. "'I am, sir, thanks to your wine.' The captain's features were no more human than were Elric's. They were at once finer and more powerful than those of the Melnibonean, yet bore a slight resemblance in that the eyes were inclined to taper, as did the face toward the chin. The captain's long hair fell to his shoulders in red-gold waves and was kept back from his brow by a circlet of blue jade. His body was clad in buff-colored tunic and hose, and there were sandals of silver and silver thread laced to his calves. Apart from his clothing, he was twin to the steersman Elric had recently seen. "'Will you have more wine?' The captain moved towards a chest on the far side of the cabin, near the porthole which was closed. "'Thank you.' And now Elric realized why the eyes had not focused on him. The captain was blind." For all that his movements were deft and assured, it was obvious he could not see at all. He poured the wine from a silver jug into a silver cup and began to cross towards Elric, holding the cup out before him. Elric stepped forward and accepted it. I am grateful for your decision to join us. I am much relieved, sir. You are courteous. Though I must add that my decision was not difficult to make, I had nowhere else to go. I understand that. It is why we put into shore when and where we did. You will find that all your companions were in a similar position before they too came aboard. You appear to have considerable knowledge of the movements of many men. Elric held the wine untasted in his left hand. Many, on many worlds. I understand you are a person of culture, sir, so you will be aware of something of the nature of the sea upon which my ship sails. I think so. She sails between the worlds, for the most part, between the planes of a variety of aspects of the same world, to be a little more exact. The captain hesitated, turning his blind face away from Elric. Please know that I do not deliberately mystify you. There are some things I do not understand, and other things which I may not completely reveal. It is a trust I have and I hope you feel you can respect it. I have no reason as yet to do otherwise. And Elric took a sip of the wine. I find myself with a fine company. I hope that you continue to think it worthwhile honoring my trust when we reach our destination. And what is that, Captain? An island indigenous to these waters? That must be a rarity. Indeed it is and once undiscovered, uninhabited by those we must count our enemies, now that they have found it and realize its power, we are in great danger. We? You mean your race and those aboard your ship? 
the captain smiled. I have no race save myself. I speak, I suppose, of all humanity. These enemies are not human, then? No. They are inextricably involved in human affairs, but this fact has not instilled in them any loyalty to us. I use humanity, of course, in its broader sense, to include yourself and myself. I understood. What is this folk called? Many things. F forgive me, but I cannot continue longer now. If you will ready yourself for battle, I assure you, I will reveal more to you as soon as the time is right. Only when Elric stood again outside the reddish-brown door, watching Eric Jose advancing up the deck through the mist, did the albino wonder if the captain had charmed him to the point where he'd forgotten all common sense. Yet the blind man had impressed him, and he had, after all, nothing better to do than to sail on to the island. He shrugged. He could always alter his decision if he discovered that those upon the island were not, in his opinion, enemies. "'Are you more mystified or less, Elric?' said Eric Jose, smiling. "'More mystified in some ways, and less in others. And for some reason, I do not care. Then you share the feeling of the whole company.' It was only when Eric Jose led him to the cabin after the mast— that Elric realized he had not asked the captain what the significance of the four might be. Chapter 3 Some Reference to the Three Who Are One Save that it faced in the opposite direction, the other cabin resembled the first in almost every detail. Here, too, were seated some dozen men, all experienced soldiers of fortune by their features and their clothing. Two sat together at a center of the table's starboard side. One was bareheaded, fair and careworn. The, the other had features resembling Elric's own, and he seemed to be wearing a silver gauntlet on his left hand, while the right hand was naked. His armor was delicate and outlandish. He looked up as Elric entered, and there was recognition in his single eye. The other was covered by a brocade work patch. Elric of Melnibone, my theories become more meaningful. He turned to his companion. See, Hawkmoon, this is the one of whom I spoke. You know me, sir? Elric was nonplussed. You recognize me, Elric, you must. At the Tower of Voilodian Gagnastiac. With Ericose, though a different Ericose. I am Corum. I know of no such tower, no name which resembles that, and this is the first I've seen of Ericose. You know me, and you know my name, but I do not know you. I, I find this disconcerting, sir. I, too, had never met Prince Coram before he came aboard, said Ericose. Yet he insists we fought together once. I am inclined to believe him. Time on the different planes does not always run concurrently. Prince Coram might well exist in what we would term the future. I had thought to find some relief from such paradoxes here, said Hawkmoon, passing his hand over his face. He smiled bleakly. But it seems there is none at this present moment in the history of the planes. Everything is in flux. And even our identities, it seems, are prone to alter at any moment. We were three, said Coram. Do you not recall it, Elric, the three who are one? Elric shook his head. Coram shrugged, saying softly to himself, Well, now we are four. Did the captain say anything of an island we're supposed to invade? He did. Do you know who these enemies might be? We know no more or less than you do, Elric, said Hawkmoon. I seek a place called Tanelorn, and two children. Perhaps I seek the rune staff too. Uh, of that, I am not entirely sure. We found it once, said Coram. We three, in the tower of Voilodian Gagnastiac. It was of considerable help to us. As it might be to me, Hawkmoon told him. I served it once. 
I gave it a great deal. We have much in common, Eric Hosey put in. As I told you, Elric, perhaps we share masters in common, too? Elric shrugged. I serve no master but myself. And he wondered why they all smiled in the same strange way. Eric Hosey said quietly, On such ventures as these one is inclined to forget much, as one forgets a dream. This is a dream, said Hawkman. Of late, I have dreamed many such. It is all dreaming, if you like, said Coram. All existence. Elric was not interested in such philosophizing. Dream or reality, the experience amounts to the same, does it not? Oh, quite right, said Eric Jose with a wan smile. They talked on for another hour or two until Coram stretched and yawned and commented he was feeling sleepy. The others agreed that they were all tired, and so they left the cabin and went aft and below, where there were bunks for all the warriors. As he stretched himself out in one of the bunks, Elric said to Brute of Lashmar, who had climbed into the bunk above, It would help to know when this fight begins. Brute looked over the edge down at the prone albino. I think it will be soon. Elric stood alone upon the deck, leaning upon the rail and trying to make out the sea, but the sea, like the rest of the world, was hidden by white curling mist. Elric wondered if there were waters flowing under the ship's keel at all. He looked up to where the sail was tight and swollen at the mast, filled with warm and powerful wind. It was light, but again it was not possible to tell the hour of the day. Puzzled by Coram's comments concerning an earlier meeting, Elric wondered if there had been other dreams in his life such as this might be, dreams he'd forgotten completely upon awakening. But the uselessness of such speculation became quickly evident, and he turned his attention to more immediate matters, wondering at the origin of the captain and his strange ship sailing on a stranger ocean. The captain, said Hawkmoon, and Elric turned to bid good morning to the tall, fair-haired man who bore a strange, regular scar in the center of his forehead, has requested that we four visit him in his cabin. The other two emerged from the mist, and together they made their way to the prow, knocking on the reddish-brown door and being at once admitted into the presence of the blind captain, who had four silver wine cups already poured for them. He gestured them towards the great chest on which the wine stood. Please help yourselves, my friends. They did so, standing there with the cups in their hands, four tall, doom-haunted swordsmen, each of a strikingly different cast of features, yet each bearing a certain stamp which marked them as being of a like kind. Elric noticed it, for all that he was one of them, and he tried to recall the details of what Coram had told him on the previous evening. We are nearing our destination. It will not be long before we disembark. I do not believe our enemies expect us, yet it will be a hard fight against those two. Two? said Hawkmoon. Only two? Only two, the captain smiled. A brother and a sister. Sorcerers from quite another universe than ours. Due to recent disruptions in the fabric of our worlds, of which you know something, Hawkmoon, and you too, Coram, certain beings have been released who would not otherwise have the power they now possess, and possessing great power, they crave for more for all the power that there is in our universe. These beings are amoral in a way in which the lords of law or chaos are not. They do not fight for influence upon the earth as the gods do. Their only wish is to convert the essential energy of our universe to their own uses. I believe they foster some ambition in their particular universe, which would be furthered if they could achieve their wish. At present, in spite of conditions highly favorable to them, they have not attained their full strength, but the time is not far off before they do attain it. Agak and Gagak is how they are called in human tongue, and they are outside the power of any of our gods, so a more powerful group has been summoned. 
yourselves. The Champion Eternal in four of his incarnations, and four is the maximum number we can risk without precipitating further unwelcome disruptions among the planes of Earth. Arakose, Elric, Corum, and Hawkmoon. Each of you will command four others whose fates are linked with your own, and who are great fighters in their own right, though they do not share your destinies in every sense. You may each pick the four with whom you wish to fight. I think you will find it easy enough to decide. We make landfall quite shortly now. You will lead us, said Hawkmoon. I cannot. I can only take you to the island and wait for those who survive, if any survive. Elric frowned. This fight is not mine, I think. It is yours, said the captain, and it is mine. I would land with you if that were permitted me, but it is not. Why so? said Coram. You will learn that one day. I have not the courage to tell you. I bear you nothing but good will, however. Be assured of that. Eric Jose rubbed his jaw. Well, since it is my destiny to fight, and since I, like Hawkmoon, continue to seek Tanalorn, and since I gather there's some chance of my fulfilling my ambition if I'm successful, I, for one, agree to go against these two, Agak and Gagak. Hawkmoon nodded. I go with Ericose for similar reasons. And I, said Coram. Not long since, said Elric. I counted myself without comrades. Now I have many. For that reason alone, I will fight with them. It is perhaps the best of reasons, said Ericosi, approvingly. There is no reward for this work, save my assurance that your success will save the world much misery, said the captain. And for you, Elric, there is less reward than the rest may hope for. Perhaps not, said Elric. As you say, the captain gestured toward the jug of wine. More wine, my friends? They each accepted, while the captain continued his blind face staring upward at the roof of the cabin. Upon this island is a ruin. Perhaps it was once a city called Tanalorn, and in the center of the ruin stands one whole building. It is this building which Agak and his sister use. It is that which you must attack. You will recognize it, I hope, at once. And must we slay this pair? said Ericose. If you can. They have servants who help them. These must be slain also. Then the building must be fired. This is important. The captain paused. Fired. It must be destroyed in no other way. Elric smiled a dry smile. There are few other ways of destroying buildings, Sir Captain. The captain returned his smile and made a slight bow of acknowledgement. Aye, it is so. Nonetheless, it's worth remembering what I have said. Do you know what these two look like, these Agak and Gagak? said Coram. No. It's possible that they resemble creatures of our own worlds. It's possible they do not. Few have seen them. It is only recently they've been able to materialize at all. And how may they be best overwhelmed? said Hawkmoon. By courage and ingenuity. You are not very explicit, sir, said Elric. I am as explicit as I can be. Now, my friends, I suggest you rest and prepare your arms. As they returned to their cabins, Eric Jose sighed. We are fated. We have little free will, for all we deceive ourselves otherwise. If we perish or live through this venture, it will not count for much in the overall scheme of things. I think you are of gloomy turn of mind, friend, said Hawkmoon. The mist snaked through the branches of the mast, writhing in the rigging, flooding the deck. It swirled across the faces of the other three men as Elric looked at them. A realistic turn of mind, said Coram. The mist massed more thickly upon the deck, mantling each man like a shroud. The timbers of the ship creaked, and to Elric's ears took on the sound of a raven's croak. It 
was colder now. In silence they went to their cabins to test the hooks and buckles of their armor, to polish and to sharpen their weapons, and to pretend to sleep. Ugh, I've no liking for sorcery, said Brute of Lashmar, tugging at his golden beard. For sorcery it was resulted in my shame. Elric had told him all that the captain had said, and had asked Brute to be one of the four who fought with him when they landed. It is all sorcery here, Otto Blenker said, and he smiled wanly as he gave Elric his hand. I'll fight beside you, Elric. His sea-green armor shimmering faintly in the lantern light, another rose. His cask pushed back from his face. It was a face almost as white as Elric's, though the eyes were deep and near black. And I, said Hound Serpent Tamer, though I fear I am little use on still land. The last to rise at Elric's glance was a warrior who had said little during the earlier conversations. His voice was deep and hesitant. He wore a plain iron battle cap, and the red hair beneath it was braided. At the end of each braid was a small finger bone, which rattled on the shoulders of his burney as he moved. This was Ashnar the Lynx, whose eyes were rarely less than fierce. I lack the eloquence of the breeding of you other gentlemen. And I have no familiarity with sorcery or those other things of which you speak, but I'm a good soldier, and my joy is in fighting. I'll take your orders, Elric, if you'll have me. Willingly, said Elric. There is no dispute, it seems, said Eric Jose to the remaining four who had been elected to join him. All this is doubtless preordained. Our destinies have been linked from the first. Such philosophy can lead to unhealthy fatalism, said Turndrick of Hasgan. Best believe our fates are our own, even if the evidence denies it. You must think as you wish, said Eric Jose. I have led many lives, though all save one are remembered but faintly. Yet I deceive myself, I suppose, in that I work for a time when I shall find this Tanalorn, and perhaps be reunited with the one I seek. That ambition is what gives me energy, Turndrick. Elric smiled. I fight, I think, because I relish the comradeship of battle. That in itself is a melancholy condition in which to find oneself, is it not? I. Eric Jose glanced at the floor. Well, we must try to rest now. Chapter 4 of Pain, Violence, and Loss The outlines of the coast were dim. They waded through white water and white mist, their swords held above their heads. Swords were their only weapons. Each of the four possessed a blade of unusual size and design, but none bore a sword which occasionally murmured to itself, as did Elric Stormbringer. Glancing back, Elric saw the captain standing at the rail, his blind face turned towards the island, his pale lips moving as if he spoke to himself. Now the water was waist-deep, and the sand beneath Elric's feet hardened and became smooth rock. He waded on, wary and ready to carry any attack to those who might be defending the island. But now the mist grew thinner, as if it could gain no hold on the land, and there were no obvious signs of defenders. Tucked into his belt, each man had a brand, its end wrapped in oil cloth so that it should not be wet when the time came to light it. Similarly, each was equipped with a handful of smoldering tinder and a little firebox in a pouch attached to his belt, so the brands could be instantly ignited. Only fire will destroy this enemy forever, the captain had said again as he handed them their brands and their tinder boxes. As the mist cleared, it revealed a landscape of dense shadows. The shadows spread over red rock and yellow vegetation, and they were shadows of all shapes and dimensions, resembling all manner of things. They seemed cast by the huge blood-colored sun, which stood at perpetual noon above the island. But what was disturbing about them was that the shadows themselves seemed without a source, as if the objects they represented were invisible, or existed elsewhere than on the island itself. The sky, too, seemed full of these shadows, but whereas those on the island were still, those in the sky sometimes moved, perhaps when the clouds moved. 
and all the while the red sun poured down its bloody light and touched the twenty men with its unwelcome radiance, just as it touched the land. And at times, as they advanced cautiously inland, a peculiar flickering light crossed the island, so that the outlines of the place became unsteady for a few seconds before returning to focus. Elric suspected his eyes and said nothing, until Hound Serpent Tamer, who was having difficulty finding his land legs, remarked, I have rarely been ashore, it's true, but I think the quality of this land is stranger than any other I've known. It shimmers. It distorts. Several voices agreed with him. And from whence come all these shadows? Ashnar the Lynx stared around him in unashamed superstitious awe. Why cannot we see what casts them? It could be, Coram said that these shadows are cast by objects existing in other dimensions of the earth. If all dimensions meet here, as has been suggested, that could be a likely explanation. He put his silver hand to his embroidered eye patch. This is not the strangest example I've witnessed of such a conjunction. Likely. <sighs> Otto Blinker snorted. Pray, let none give me an unlikely explanation, if you please. They pressed on through the shadows and the lurid light until they arrived at the outskirts of the ruins. These ruins, thought Elric, had something in common with the ramshackle city of Amiron, which he had visited on his quest for the Black Sword, but they were altogether more vast, more a collection of smaller cities, each one in a radically different architectural style. Perhaps this is Tanalorn, said Coram who had visited the place, or rather, all the versions of Tannerlorn there have ever been, for Tannerlorn exists in many forms, each form depending upon the wishes of those who most desire to find her. This is not the Tannerlorn I expected to find, said Hawkmoon bitterly. Nor I, added Ericose, bleakly. Perhaps it is not Tannerlorn, said Elric. Perhaps it is not. Or perhaps this is a graveyard, said Coram distantly, frowning with his single eye. A graveyard containing all the forgotten versions of that strange city. They began to clamber over the ruins, their arms clattering as they moved, heading for the center of the place. Elric could tell by the introspective expressions in the faces of many of his companions that they, like him, were wondering if this were not a dream. Why else should they find themselves in this peculiar situation, unquestioningly risking their lives, perhaps their souls, in a fight with which none of them was identified? Erikose moved closer to Elric as they marched. Have you noticed that the shadows now represent something? Elric nodded. You can tell from the ruins what some of the buildings looked like when they were whole. The shadows are the shadows of those buildings the original buildings before they became ruined. Just so, said Ericose. Together, they shuddered. At last they approached the likely center of the place, and here was a building which was not ruined. It stood in a cleared space, all curves and ribbons of metal and glowing tubes. It resembles a machine more than a building, said Hawkmoon, and a musical instrument more than a machine. Coram mused. The party came to a halt, each group of four gathering about its leader. There was no question they had arrived at their goal. Now that Elric looked carefully at the building, he could see it was in fact two buildings, both absolutely identical and joined at various points by curling systems of pipes which might be connecting corridors, although it was difficult to imagine what manner of being could utilize them. Two buildings, said Ericose. We were not prepared for this. Shall we split up and attack both? Instinctively, Elric felt that this action would be unwise. He shook his head. I think we should go together into one, else our strength will be weakened. I agree, said Hawkmoon, and the rest nodded. Thus, there being no cover to speak of, they marched boldly towards the nearest building, to a point near the ground where a black opening of irregular proportions could be discerned. Ominously, there was still no sign of defenders. The buildings pulsed and glowed and occasionally whispered, but that was all. 
Elric and his party were the first to enter, finding themselves in a damp, warm passage which curved almost immediately to the right. They were followed by the others until all stood in this passage, warily glaring ahead, expecting to be attacked. But no attack came. With Elric at their head, they moved on for some moments before the passage began to tremble violently and sent Hound Serpent Tamer crashing to the floor, cursing. As the man in the sea-green armor scrambled up, a voice began to echo along the passage, seemingly coming from a great distance, yet nonetheless loud and irritable. Who, 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 who invades me? The passage's tremble subsided a little into a constant quivering motion. The voice became a muttering, detached and uncertain. What attacks? What? 